Hi, you're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political, social television magazine on New Channel TV. I'm Mariam Namazi, and I'm presenting this week's program with my fantastic co-host Bahram Suruj. Hello. And Fari Wars Puya. Hi. In this week's program, we're going to be speaking about whether morality is possible without God. Well, of course it is and where our values come from. And it's great because we've got an interview with the author Keenan Malik, who very conveniently for us has just done a book on this issue and it's called The Quest for a Moral Compass, A Global History of Ethics. Here's a little more about the issue before we get into our discussion. Stay with us. In The Quest for a Moral Compass, Keenan Malik explores the history of moral thought as it has developed over three millennia, from Homer's Greece to Mao's China, from ancient India to modern America. It tells the stories of the great philosophers and confronts some of humanity's deepest questions. He also brings morality down to earth, showing how throughout history, social needs and political desires have shaped moral thinking. The thing for me is when we are discussing the issue of uh, morality and religious morality, I often find it really absurd to some extent because I find religious laws quite immoral in many instances. So for example, you've got, you know, Islamic law says that stoning a woman to death is perfectly fine and perfectly moral. Marrying a nine-year-old child, which is pedophilia, is perfectly right and moral. And then on the other hand, you've got things like sex, music, dance, things that are very good and moral for society are actually considered bad and legal. So there is this huge discrepancy between really the values and morality of people versus those of the ruling elite or governments like the Islamic regime of Iran. I think uh, um, usually religious morality, if we can call it, is restriction and social control. Um, and that's when we look at the history of uh, religious institution, religious laws, religious systems, they're all related to restriction imposed by through the religious laws and practices and customs. I think that's what it is. That's why people, when, when you talk about morality, religious morality, people want to get, get away from those restrictions and that's what it is. But there are values that are universal and that are that have nothing to do with religious morality yeah, in a I mean, sense because it, one of the things yeah. uh, that Keenan Malik talks about in his book is the fact that it's, it's morality and values are things that we, we uh, create and every era, every time is different. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, it is uh, time conditioned. You know, it, it's not something that you have absolute norms that have existed uh, from, you know, uh, time immemorial. You know, it's not like that. It's a, a, a product of every t age or every society that we live in. Um, and it is not uh, anything. They're all man-made. They're all... Uh, you know, norms that people establish amongst themselves. And the question is, what kind of morality uh, you're talking about, you know? So you can have morality, um, unfortunately, uh, probably where the confusion comes from is associated, has got a positive, you know, connotation. And people associate mo morals, you know, something good. But then, you, as you said yourself, m morality, you can have religious morality. And um, it's not just restriction. I think it's also the, uh, religious morality is very backward. You know, mm. um, I mean, it, as if it has time hasn't moved on. At all. It's funny because someone had tweeted us about uh, you know when I said we're going to be interviewing Keenan Malik about well isn't religion just a lazy way of being moral because you're told what to do and and then you don't have to think about it and decide whether it's good or bad. And I think that this is uh, this is it. Where society decides to regulate behaviour. I think, you know, or find the, the best thing how society could live, people can live together, the quite positive, positive sort of aspect of that. But that's constantly been questioned, constantly been criticized, constantly changed according to latest thinking. So it's something that is constantly sort of revised, but there's no set framework forever. Uh, um, you know, unchanging. I mean, that, that's the important part of um, where this is the important thing when society constantly changes things. But the, the difficulty is that religious morality is unchanging, and that's where the restrictions and oppressive nature of it comes from. And, and, and also, yes, because there's a contradiction between what people believed in about 2,000 years ago and uh, what society believes in now. We have moved on. We believe in um, uh, secular values or uh, respect for human beings, human life, you know, for many other things are much more advanced than the, the uh, society of, say, 1,500 years ago, 2,000 years ago. 
So that kind of morality, if you bring it to the 21st century, obviously it's going to be regressive. It's, and that is why the church and, and religions usually, they are in the way of any progress. You know? So in, in that sense, when they put this question to you, that they are as if they are the um, uh, owners of morality, we should say, what kind of morality? Your morality is, as you said, it, they're very reactionary. They don't um, respect or recognize what humanity has achieved so far. You know? Yeah, I mean, definitely. But I, we wonder what you think about these issues. I mean, these are quite important issues. These are things that people often think about, where our values come from, what, you know, what we're, we're here for, what we're doing. Um, and of course, human will has a huge part in this, you know, and in fact, it, it is us that are, is determining these sort of very wonderful uh, universal values like secularism, like, you know, um, equality, like freedom, things that, things that people have fought for. Let's go now and listen to the interview with Keenan Malik, and then we'll come back to discuss it further. Stay with us. Hello, Keenan Malik. Welcome to our program. Pleasure. I wanted to speak to you about a new book you've written. Uh, I think it's going to be another one of your brilliant books. It's The Quest for a Moral Compass. And for me, I mean, when I, when I see that you've done this book and it's a global history of ethics, it seems quite a relevant thing to write in this day and age. Why, why did you decide to write it now? There's a tendency to see morality as existing in its own sphere, to think about um, moral norms um, as absolute, as there for all times, um, as something beyond human life, as given by God or by nature or whatever. And I wanted to historicise morality, to show that it's part and parcel of our lives and our history, and then one can talk about the history of morality just as one can talk about the history of economics or of politics or of society. And, and as societies change, and as our visions, our, our ideas about what it means to be human change. So our concepts of right and wrong, good and evil also change, and, and it's telling that story. I mean, it's interesting because very often when you talk about morality, we're told that it's religion that gives us the basis of that morality. And to historicize it somehow turns that idea over uh, upside down in some ways. It does uh, to a large degree because it shows that religion too is a historical product that, um, you know, in the, in the old way of putting it, um, human, uh, God didn't create humans, humans created God. And in that sense, humans created uh, the idea that God created morality. Um, so yes, it, 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 it looks as, at religion and religious morality in, histori in the historical context. Um, looks at the rise of monotheism, for instance, and what difference the mon monotheism made to our concepts of morality. And then it looks at um, uh, also the rise of modernity um, and the creation of a, uh, a moral order which wasn't based on, on God. Um, and it then looks at the contemporary world too where a lot of people have returned to the idea that uh, morality is God created. Um, and so it, it looks at the shifts and changes but tr tries to understand those shifts and changes in um, historical, social, economic, political terms. Someone asked uh, us to ask you whether religion is just a lazy way of being moral. I wouldn't call it lazy. It's certainly misguided. Um, the idea that you need some kind of external validation for moral norms. Um, that God needs to define what is right and wrong. When in fact it's us as human beings who define right and wrong. Um, that is misguided and, and often deeply problematic. Um, in a sense, faith in God is the other side of a loss of faith in human beings, um, a loss of faith in our ability to uh, create norms, values, to shape our lives without guidance from beyond, uh, uh, to, be, to be rational about uh, how we live. Um, and it, in, in a sense, the, the desire to look to God as a, as, as, as a means of, of, of validating our norms is a, is a sense of, it expresses a sense of pessimism about our own abilities to do that. One of the arguments in the book is that 
values come from human beings and no one else. We're responsible for them. We have to create them. Uh, we create meaning in the world, we create values in the world, and it's up to us and no one else. That can be a frightening thought, and it is to many people, or it can be an exhilarating one, because it's up to us and no one else. Being human, the choice is ours. I mean, a part, part of uh, the sort of religious morality does also come, not necessarily only from pessimism in our own abilities, but also uh, as a way of control, and just, you know, um, controlling populations in a sense. So you do see oftentimes a clash between those who are seen to be religious, um, you know, groups and communities, versus these sort of religious morals. Sure, morality is always contested. Um, values are always contested because values are about the kinds of societies in which we want to live. They define what we mean by flourishing. They define the kinds of institutions um, under which humans best flourish. Um, they define the kind of societies under which humans best flourish, and those questions are always contested. So to say that God tells you that this is the only way to live is to cut short that debate, is to say, well, we're not having that debate because we already know. And so, yes, it's, it's a way of imposing control um, and, and to um, undermine, to, to, to shut down debates of how we actually ought to live. I mean, one of the things you mention is the fact that uh, you know, one, values are contested and also no group or community or society is homogeneous. And in that sense then, when you're looking at this issue of uh, morality, there isn't then a sort of morality that everybody agrees in, Christian morality versus Islamic morality, Muslims and Christians and so on and so forth, which is often the sort of world we're, we're given. Sure, uh, Christians and um, uh, Muslims are as uh, at odds about morality and values as, as, as anybody else. Um, every year I give a, a lecture to a, a group of theology students on why I'm an atheist. And the question that always comes up is, the trouble with being an atheist is that there's no fixed moral values. You have to pick and choose. Um, and I say, yes, that's true. But that's also true of believers, because believers also have to pick and choose. Now you take the Bible. Um, this is a, I, I talk, I'm talking to a group of Christian students here, Christian theologians here. They you know, take uh, the Bible. In the Bible, Leviticus sanctifies slavery. It tells us that adulterers should be killed. Um, Exodus tells us witches should be burnt. Now, not many modern-day Christians would believe that, but for thousands of years they did. Um, uh, witches were burnt, people were enslaved because they thought God had sanctified it. Now, it isn't that God has changed his mind, societies have changed, and as societies have changed, we bring new moral values to it. Um, even today, there are some Christians who read certain passages in the Bible and think that gays should be executed. Others read the same book and think that there's no problem in ordaining gays. Um, so, in each case, they bring their own values, which doesn't come from from God or from the Bible, but from outside, and use the Bible as a means of saying, by my values are right. The point I make to them, and it's the same with, 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 with the Quran, you know, there are um, jihadi literalists, there are so-called moderate bridge builders, there are liberals, all of whom read the same book and come to very different views about apostasy or women's rights or just wars or punishments and so on. So, um, so the point I make um, to my students or, or, or to whoever is that believing in God doesn't obviate the need for us having to make up our minds as to what is right and wrong. The difference between me and a believer is that I'm honest about it. I say, well, yes, we're the ones who, who make values and it's up to us and nobody else. Believers make those values and then try and alienate it to some external authority because it seems to give them greater force. So where, I mean, you, you did refer to it to some extent, but where do our values and where do, does morality come from? From it us, come from I ourselves mean. as human beings. Uh, there are a number of different um, sources I mean, uh, from which humanly created values come from. One is empathy. We're, we're social beings, we empathise, we we feel for each other, we sympathise with each other, uh, and, 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 and out of that empathy comes our sense that we should live in a certain way, we should have certain values, that certain values are wrong, certain values are right, 
Um, we, those are debated and contested, but nevertheless, without empathy, we wouldn't have morality. Um, the fact that we live in um, uh, communities, um, so the communities in which we live, um, shapes the kinds of values uh, to which we hold, um, sometimes for the good, sometimes for the ill, but, never, but they always do, and reason. We can look upon the world and use, you know, use our empathy and the fact that we live in communities and apply reason to that to say, what are the best values um, under which humans will flourish? What are the best forms of governance? What are the best institutions? So there are different, w there are different tools we can use and that are necessary. But the fact is that whatever tools we use, there is no uh, going beyond human beings for, for the creation of values. So, I mean, I suppose one of the questions that this brings is the issue of, you know, whether everything is relative, uh, because that's something we keep hearing about, or whether there are some universal values, and what's the difference between universal values and having absolute values? I certainly believe that there are certain uh, values, certain norms, certain um, institutions, certain kinds of societies, um, under which humans best flourish, all humans, not just you know, Muslims or Christians or British or Iranians or Americans, but all, all, all um, humans. And you know, we can talk about those kinds of values, you know, values of equality, for instance, of a, uh, of a secular world and so on. Um, we, 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 uh, other, others would disagree as, as to what values uh, are good, but we can have a debate about that. But, but I think from my perspective, um, there are certain values under which all humans best flourish. But to say that, to say that there are universal values in that sense, is not to say, it's not the same as saying there are absolute values, because to say there are absolute values is to say that values are fixed for all time and beyond the human sphere, um, which are, uh, are my view is that humans create values, um, and we do it through uh, discussion, dialogue, action. Um, and through um, discussing and, 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 uh, and debating with each other and by acting upon the world, we come to realise what are the best forms of uh, uh, social institutions, what are the best values under, under which uh, we best flourish, and, and that's what's important. Mm. So th there is a clash of values taking place, in a sense, not a clash between, um, you know, I, I don't agree with the whole Huntington's clash of civilizations, but there is a clash of values taking place, not just between the West and the East, but you know, within societies, uh, particularly if I'm thinking about Islamism and the, ri the rise of the religious right and the clash with that. How, how do you see that going ahead and, you know? Well, as I said, values are always contested. Yeah. Um, they're inevitably contested. And, and you're right, the, 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 uh, the clash of civilization um, argument doesn't uh, hold. Um, doesn't have any, 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 any evidentially force behind it because um, for two reasons. One, that um, each of what Huntington would call, Samuel Huntington would call a civilization, is as, is as, um, uh, it's not, none of them are homogenous. No civilization is homogenous. Um, what we call the West, for instance, um, is as divided over the kinds of values it sees best as any other civilization. Um, and historically, those, those values have changed. So they're what we now call the West, believed in um, slavery um, only 150 years ago, uh, believed in burning witches only 300 years ago. Um, so values change over time. So the idea that there is some kind of trans-historical set of values um, belonging to a particular civilization um, is absurd. Um, but as you said, what there are is a is a contestation about what are the best sets of values to, to hold to, and, and that, that is inevitable. And th those, are, those, are, uh, those are battled within societies, within communities, and we ought to recognise it as that. So we, sh we should defend particular values, not particular communities or particular civilizations. Um, and part of the problem is that people have come to be drawn to de defending not particular values, but particular civilizations or cultures because they're particular civilizations or cultures, irrespective of the values that might be expressed. I think also it's a problem because, going back to what I was saying before, that people have 
lost faith in the ability, in their own ability, the ability of humans to create values, to create norms, to create societies. So increasingly they looked back to God um, as, a, as a kind of anchor for values. And to a certain degree, fundamentalism is, is an expression of that. Um, the idea that, that um, but it's also a very uh, useful way of, of doing it for, for themselves because, as you say, it's, it's, a, it's a form of control and authority. Um, it, by saying that God decrees that this is so, um, then they can impose their will upon people who may disagree. Uh, and so it's a, the rise of fundamentalism is an is, is a, um, expression of a, of a number of different developments in the modern world. Uh, uh, and, uh, it needs to be challenged, but it also needs to be challenged as a specifically modern phenomenon. This is, this is not a you know, 7th century uh, phenomenon. This is a, a modern phenomenon that comes out of the, the, the issues we face in the modern world. Okay, thank you very much. Pleasure. enjoyed that interview with Kinan Malik. I think there are really many important points raised there. I mean, one of the things though I'm not sure I agree with is this whole thing of, um, if I understood it correctly, is that people have sort of lost faith in their ability to, um, you know, uh, bring about a moral world and that's why there's been like a religious revival and people going back to religion. And I think in fact it's the religious right that's imposing its hugely barbaric values on a vast majority of people. It's not necessarily a religious revival. And in fact, what we're seeing is, and I think there's something I discussed with him too, is it's not a clash of civilizations, but a clash within civilizations. And, you know, particularly between people and, you know, 21st century values and the ruling elite and oppressive think, states like I, I the think, Iranian regime. I think one thing is clear that the globalization and the fact that, you know, societies has moved into a different stage, um, a lot of sort of ideas and, in, um, uh, and conflicts is created, you know, the, the, the given framework has changed. I think that, that's a fact. But at the same time, through that sort of change, you'll see a backward move from a clearly driven by political interest. These are you, most of it by the right-wing political groups. They've reconfigured themselves and they're trying to redefine sort of uh, societies and standards. That's what's happened. And you could see the, the reflection of that in the ri rise of the right-wing religious in America. You've seen that the rise of the religious uh, movement in in um, in. Um, in Middle East, and these are all politically driven. But They're also, on the other hand, you are seeing people's intervention for their own human values through revolution. I think that's some, one of the most human way of people bringing their own sort of morality I mean, into the public scene. I think when people say that we have, uh, I mean, if the contention is that people have lost faith, when you lose faith in something, you're rejecting something. But Positively, you're saying that you, you believe in something else. And I think you are reacting to something which you don't believe in. If you have lost um, faith in politicians, in the establishment, if uh, we ask you, you know, what you believe in, you've got a set of morals, yeah. you know? And I think that's the clash. That's the clash between what people um, believe in and believe uh, that are progressive morals and what they detest or have lost faith in, which are those of the establishment. And this, this, and, this, and, this and, is, to, to some extent, yeah. a contradiction that exists in society, that people are actually question the, the status quo and the given yeah. situation. Which is a good thing, yeah. in a yeah. sense. Uh, I mean, like when the, this 99% movement started, mm -hmm. people came out on the street and they said, we don't accept your establishment. You know, they were questioning that. And um, I'm, I think I agree with you that I don't uh, notice, observe anything religious revival you know amongst the people uh, you can say what you can see are the political sects sorry religious sects who are on the rampage you know and, and they are but if you look at the statistics 
in, in Europe especially, for example, uh, you've got um, uh, a fall, a constant decline in church attendance and people becoming members of different churches, you know. And um, there's a backlash as well in countries uh, under Islamic rule, like in Iran, there's a backlash against. So there is not a revival. I think people are actually, to be, um, to be I think, more correctly, they're moving away from uh, religious morals. I think that's my understanding. Yeah, and, and I think we've spoken about this before as well in, in, on the program, the very fact that there's such a clash between the sort of religious right versus the population at large that you can see very clearly that it's the morality has their, you know, immorality to a large extent has to be imposed by brute force. Otherwise, there's a huge, you know, opposition to it at every level, you know, from women refusing to not go to, you know, accept that they're not allowed to go into stadiums, pretending they're men, pretending they're Brazilian to go into a volleyball game between Brazil and Iran, to unveiling, even though it's compulsory in Iran, to eating during Ramadan, even though it's met with flogs, flogging and, yeah. and imprisonment and so on and so forth. Oh, so there's this huge the, clash all the, the time. There is a revival of use of religion by the state and Definitely. the ruling class. I mean, yeah. that's the... That's yeah. the Revival, but at the same time, there is a backlash and renaissance against the religious sort of morality, and we could see that undermining the whole sort of this. So there is a clash, and there is a contradiction, and reflects the clash and co uh, um, contradiction that exists in society. I think, and, and that's why you need uh, uh, brute force in order to impose it. It's an imposition. Otherwise, if people were left uh, to decide themselves, to choose themselves, a lot of people, you know, would not choose. Um, uh, religion or uh, their morals, and which they don't, and and, and, and it's, it's not just, complex. and I think it's not just moral. Uh, sorry, uh, I think it's, you're absolutely right. I think it's not just brute force, but also the fact that when you turn on the TV, everywhere you can see how the state supports uh, religious uh, institutions every day as part mm -hmm. of the establishment. I mean, they keep telling us that we can't live a moral life without God, but in fact, I think what uh, a lot of people across the world are showing, particularly faced with a, a, a really brutal religious right is that definitely there are a lot of yeah. people who can live without religion basic, and they're doing it really well. Basic existence of society now, people to survive, to live uh, uh, comfortably is in contradiction with religious laws and restrictions and morality. Yeah, and let's it's not leave a question it at that. of lack of morals, it's a question of what kind of morals. Morals, that's right, because mm. every society and within a society, I mean very often, you know, when people talk about Iran or Britain, they it's, it's as if it's one homogeneous group, and it's not. There's all these conflicting morals and values, and it is a challenge every day, isn't it, between especially the powers that be and people. I think it's now time for our insane fatwa of the week. Uh, thanks to Ben Baz Aziz. Um, this time it's about um, tight clothing and tight trousers. And basically, there's an Egyptian cleric. His name is Yasser Borhami. He's also vice president of the Salafist call. And he says that women cannot wear tight stretch trousers that hug their thighs in front of their sons or brothers, but they can do it in front of their husbands. I mean, talk about obsessing about women's clothing. All I have to say to women out there is to watch out for those stretch trousers. I'm going to try to remember not to wear them in front of my eight-year-old son, but my husband's going to be such a lucky fella. So I hope, <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this week's program. We um, enjoy bringing these programs to you. Do keep in touch. Do tell us what you think. And we look forward to seeing you again next week. Bye.